Well, it is two o'clock. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Well, I'll go ahead and we'll go ahead and get started just to give a couple of announcements before I turn it over to Jay, who I'm really excited to have with us today, is that um, today's session is actually a repeat of what was offered at KPLA in Owensboro um, in March. It was a great session. And as I put in the chat, the notes from Jay will be shared with everyone later this week, um, along with um, this will be recorded. And what KPLA is doing is actually creating a YouTube channel, channel that we are going to upload everything to and make available um, for all the libraries across the state. Um, in addition to today's session, we are doing um, like a session two is what we're sort of calling it. And it is going to be available late August and in September. It's going to be at four different locations. I will actually plug all of those dates and locations into the chat so you can see that if you want to jot um, some information down there. But that um, that session will actually build off of today and will actually give you some tools to help you build goodwill with your local government. Um, in addition to that, KPL's, KPLA is going to continue training um, with you all year long with Jay. Um, we are going to offer an opportunity for directors, public libraries to be able to schedule a meeting with Jay to where if you have some really unique, tough situations going on, you'll be able to um, be connected to Jay personally, have that conversation. And Gene Rourke is the one that's actually handling all the scheduling um, of that situation. The fourth and final piece of the puzzle is that we are going to create some training videos um, later as we receive feedback from today's session, the sessions that we offer in the fall, the conversations that people are having with Jay, we're going to um, develop training, um, recorded training that's going to be available on that YouTube channel um, for everyone to access um, at any time they need. Um, so before, you know, I hand it over to Jay, you may be um, wondering, why did we pick Jay? And I'm going to let him tell you um, more about himself. But what I want to say is two important things is he's a son of a librarian and a former elected official. So we just felt like that was the perfect combination that we needed at this time. Um, so if you have any questions throughout, we will handle all of those at the end. So just plug them into the chat. I will keep track of them. And then um, once Jay is in, um, done with his presentation, I'll sort of feed him those questions. So I hope you all enjoy. And I'm going to turn the host back over to Jay now. Fantastic. Hey, I am so excited to be with you all today. Um, as Shannon mentioned, I'm the son of a librarian. I grew up uh, hearing continually that nobody seems to understand the importance and the value of a library. Uh, and I do. I totally understand that. I recognize what a tough job you have. And as also was mentioned, I'm a recovering politician. Uh, I served four terms in city government here in Lexington. I was a city council member. And those combinations, along with the fact that I'm speaking now around how do, how do you lead in this multi-generational uh, workplace, felt like a good combination to put together unique training for you on how do you build uh, goodwill and leverage your library as a community asset in the eyes of elected officials. How do you understand what's really going on in their brains? Because uh, they seem like aliens a lot of times, which we are when we're in that role. And I'll talk more about that uh, as we go. But today is for you, I want you to sit back and enjoy the opportunity just to think of things in a different light, okay? Um, as we get rolling, I'm going to disappear from the screen. I'm going to put my picture up, and I'm just going to roll you through uh, this, this time together as, a, as an opportunity to think, opportunity to plan and strategize, and there's a couple of points where I'm going to stop and have you write some things down to consider in your own unique situation, so make sure that you have something to write with, 
uh, because you're going to walk out of here with a couple of action steps uh, that you can even do today going forward. So with that said, the last thing I will tell you is, uh, as Shannon mentioned, she's going to send you the notes from today. I want you to be able to take uh, down what matters to you as we go along. But I want you to recognize if you miss anything, you didn't miss anything. The notes are coming your way with all the important um, the important information. OK, so as I shift out of my uh, let me shift out of here and into setting up the screen. And Shannon, I'm going to ask you if you can um, if you can see this in its proper form. Does that look OK? OK, so all right, perfect. Well, we're going to roll now. So, uh, you know, it's been said that you should never look down on a day of small beginnings. And today may be that small beginning that truly changes everything for you. Today may be the day that you see you could leave a lasting legacy, that you could go to another level personally or professionally. Today may be the day you see you could impact and change the world. I mean, those are the types of things that we're going to be talking about in this session uh, as it relates to leveraging your library and yourself in the eyes of elected officials. And I want you to take today as the gift it's truly meant to be, a time for you to really just stop and think. Think about why things are the way they are. How did we get to where we are? How do you navigate these times? Because there's a lot of people in your community looking to you for answers. And, and they're looking to you in ways that maybe they've never done that before, never asked that of you before, uh, to navigate for them these crazy times we live in. Now, the problem with the times we live in is, is that people have become super skeptical as to who to trust with helping them. Uh, who is it that I can actually, uh, can I cannot trust that will get me to where I need to go, all right? And I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to have just a few minutes with you and, and lending me your trust. Now, before we get going, the bottom line is this, before you take any training, before you sit in any kind of presentation, you really should require the speaker, the trainer, to abide by this formula. C minus C equals C. What does that mean? Content minus context equals total confusion. Content minus context equals total confusion, you all. So let's talk about the context of today. The bottom line is that the noise out there is so turned up. It's so high that people aren't paying attention. They're not really listening uh, the way that they should be. And there's a lot of distraction, especially for local elected officials. There's a lot of noise for those people in your city and county governments that you're trying to work with uh, that's in their world. And what they don't seem to hear is that your library is truly a community asset. It's very, very hard for these folks and these elected positions with all that's happening around them and, and all that's being required of them in today's world to hear how you can be the, that community asset. And so today, what we're trying to do is help you start to see uh, ways that they can see it in the proper light, okay? So as we start today, anytime I work with anyone, individually or in groups, live or virtual, my job is to help you become people that know the times and know what to do. Think about that. If people see you as knowing the times, it means you know what's going on in their world. And if you know what to do, that's just shorthand for uh, having solutions to problems. And when you're seen as someone that knows what's going on in other people's worlds, especially my world as an elected official, and you seem to have solutions to my problems, I'm going to give you a seat at the table every time. And at the table, you're going to be very relevant. So let's talk about how we're going to uh, attack today. Simply, we're going to give you one phrase that I'm going to keep saying it throughout. If you can remember this one phrase, you're going to be so successful at building relationships uh, appropriately, okay? And then we're going to dive into the three headwinds that are facing everyone today. There are three headwinds out there challenging your success, challenging your elected leader's success, the communities you live in. We're just going to talk about those headwinds, and then we're going to dive into 
understanding the mind of those local officials, especially in light of those headwinds that are challenging. And lastly, I want to give you some very specific um, ideas that will help you positively reposition your library, or at least get you thinking in that direction. Okay, so here comes the one phrase for your success. Ready? Connection versus perfection. Connection versus perfection. Think about that for a second. Perfection has everything to do with me, how I look, how I sound, how awesome I am. Do I look perfect? How do I look in your eyes? I am very self focused when I'm worried about perfection. However, if I'm focused on my audience, and in this case, local elected officials, if I'm focused on them and what they need and, and building a connection to them, well, they're going to give me grace when I'm not 100% or when things don't go exactly right. If they know I have their best interest in mind, there's a lot of grace given there. Here's what I want you to understand going straight out of the blocks. The idea is you're supposed to be bringing value to other people. That's what we're all supposed to be doing. We're supposed to bring value to others every single day in every exchange. And I know this is a harsh statement, but if you're not bringing value, you're really just taking up space. Uh, if you're not bringing me something I don't know, well, let me flip that. If I'm not telling you something today you, you don't already know, then why are you wasting your time. I don't want to waste your time. And you certainly don't. So I've got to bring you something of value, something you may not understand or understand that way. Um, I've got to bring you something of value. And this picture is the best way I can illustrate it. The guy on the right, well, he's so thirsty, he's going to take anything wet that she's offering. Now, what's interesting about the picture is water ahead of milk in this situation. Think about that. She could offer him milk and maybe milk would benefit her more in this situation. Maybe she gets paid on how much milk she moves in a day. Uh, maybe that's the best thing for her is to get rid of a lot of milk or have people drinking that. But in this situation, she puts water ahead because that's what he would value most in this situation. So the point simply is, how do you bring, how are you bringing value to your local elected officials. Again, it's about knowing the times and knowing what to do. See, these folks that have been elected in your communities, they're trying to navigate these times and there's so much headwind on them and on you. But if you don't understand the headwinds, if you don't understand the times, then it's confusing. So let's make it super simple. There is a storm that is out there. And the storm is comprised of three headwinds. These three headwinds, what you have to understand is have never existed before. None of the three have ever existed before by themselves, meaning there's nobody out there that can really help you navigate this because there's nobody with The first is COVID. And I know we're on the other side of the COVID pandemic, but we are still gonna feel the ripple effects of COVID for, for a long time, maybe a lifetime. Unless you have someone on your staff who was around in 1918 for the Spanish flu pandemic, you don't know what to do and how to, how to operate in a pandemic, nor do I. We literally are making it up day to day. So that's the first, is a pandemic. The second is people have the shortest attention spans in history right now, you all. People have eight seconds or less of attention span, meaning we've got to be better communicators than ever before because folks are just simply not listening. And the third headwind is that we have more generations working side by side than ever before. In some cases, we now have five separate generations working side by side. That's super challenging. So let's try and make that simple so that you can understand this because you're going through this, you and your staff, your community is, but your local elected officials are trying to sort through that as well. Okay. So Let's look at the COVID effect itself. Now, as I mentioned, uh, I'm a, a recovering politician. I served four terms in uh, Lexington city government as a district city council member, served a constituency of about 30,000 people. Uh, was, our city council is made up of 15 elected officials. 12 of us were district council members, meaning we uh, took care of a, uh, a portion of the city. 
And three of our council members represented the entire city. They were at large groups. So in Lexington, you have 15 members of that legislative body along with a mayor, okay? Now, all during COVID, elected officials fell in love with this phrase, we're all in this together. We're all in this together. Every politician seemed to be saying that throughout. And that's not an untrue statement, but I think there's a better way for you to understand it and to have true empathy for people. And that is same storm, different boats. Write that down. Same storm, different boats. The bottom line is, is that the pandemic was global in scope. Everyone on the planet dealt with it somehow, some way it touched everyone, but we went through it differently. Uh, I may be going through on a yacht and you've been going through it on a life raft, okay? See, there's a big difference on just where you laid your head during the pandemic. I mean, if you were in California or New York, the rules that you had to play by were very different than Texas and Florida or Kentucky. And if you remember in those early days of COVID, how even county to county in Kentucky, there were different rules. So where you laid your head had something to do with it. Your age also had something to do with it. People that were older were said to be more vulnerable than people that were younger. If, depending upon your age, that's a uh, same storm, but a different boat. The people you lived with. So let's just say that you were totally fine. You never felt like you were ever in danger. But there were many people that you lived with that you cared about that uh, might have been more susceptible, and that concerned you greatly, and you went through differently than I did, maybe. And then, obviously, where you worked and the type of work that you actually did during COVID. So if you were a restaurant owner like these folks, or you were a commercial real estate person, you really got creamed. I mean, horrible. It was terrible. But if you were in the remodeling business, oh, my goodness, you couldn't keep up. Or if you were a veterinarian, I work with a lot of vets all over the country and they can't keep up because everybody bought a dog and a cat all during COVID. Librarians, you went through COVID differently because of the type of work that you did, okay? And the type of work of being a librarian in that space and that public space and so forth, you had challenges that I did not, okay? But your local elected officials went through it differently than you. They had challenges that you did not, okay? And what about just being a live speaker? You all, every bit of business that I had on the books in 2020 when we started evaporated when COVID hit. The first four months, 16 to 20 weeks of COVID, I didn't receive a dime, a dime. If you got a paycheck, in those first few months in 2020 of COVID, let's call it March through August, well, you went through on a yacht compared to me. I was in a life raft at that time, okay? So the point simply is the pandemic was the same storm globally, but the way we went through it is wildly different. That's super important for you to understand as we move forward. Okay, how else? The COVID effect uh, is, is, as I say, uh, same storm, different boats. The second headwind, though, is that people have the shortest attention spans in history. Did you know the average attention span out there right now is about eight seconds or less or less? So today we have eight seconds of attention span. Back in 2000, it used to be 12 seconds. Research is showing it's actually going down. And whether it's a hard fact or it's an urban legend, uh, it's said that goldfish have nine seconds of attention span. The bottom line to it is, is that people have, not, have very short attention spans, sometimes less than goldfish. And you, in the job that you do, representing the public library, you have very complex things you talk about. You're not just talking about you know, you don't make your living from selling pens and pieces of paper, very simple things. You do things that are very complex and you deal with very complex issues and budgets and, and things like that. So the point simply is, I want you to think about the last 12 months, you personally, and all the interactions you've had with people, one-on-one, one-on-many, live virtual, 
I mean, all the meetings you've conducted or the presentations you've done or the budget reports uh, that you, you've had. And I want you to ask yourself, how much time did you personally spend thinking about what you would say in that first eight seconds to let your audience know this is important to them or the context of what you were talking about? You all, I work with leaders and teams across every industry sector around the globe, and most people don't spend any time doing it. And what I'm telling you today is you, you've got to. You absolutely have to start obsessing on your audience. Connection versus perfection. Connecting to that audience. Most people just show up and throw up. Most people just, I've got this to say. I've got this report. Uh, I'm going to just spew it. Uh, they go on and on and on in their, in their report outs or their meetings, and, and they have no clue. They've already lost the majority of their audience, or they send that epistle email, that email that just goes on ever out there, and they don't recognize that people don't appreciate that, and they tune that out. And your local elected officials are hearing a lot of noises. You know, many, many people come down for public comment. Uh, this was just a, was a common scene from my seat as a council member, uh, the community coming out to uh, talk about their concerns or to present about something that's special to them. And they don't realize sometimes that the way that they were presenting, not getting to the point or not giving us the context really caused us to, in this very tight window, to kind of shut them out or not hear what they were really saying. And I don't want that to be you. I want you to be able to connect very well going forward with whoever your elected officials are, whether in the city or the county, whether uh, in the executive branch or the legislative branch. So in an eight second world, the word I want you to write down and use as your North Star is the word concise. Your communication going forward from today needs to be concise. Now, let me tell you what concise doesn't mean. It doesn't mean short. It doesn't have to mean short. A better definition of concise is nothing unnecessary. Nothing unnecessary. This is a great image of it. You know, maybe the image on the left, the office on the left, is your presentation right now, your budget report out to uh, the fiscal court or to the, the city government. Maybe this is your agenda uh, or, or your email right now. What I'm telling you is start to become ruthless about taking things out that are just not needed because people don't have the bandwidth to handle all of that. So let me give you a tool that you can start to use immediately and become better communicators uh, and connectors to anybody, not just the local officials, but this is your staff, this is your family, uh, this is anyone in the community. It's simply called three questions. The tool is called three questions. And literally, gang, before you walk into the meeting or you pick up the phone, before you craft the email or click the text, and especially before you engage these folks, the next time you engage these folks, you've got to practice the three questions. Here are the three questions. Who, what, how. You need to ask yourself who, what, how. So specifically, who is my audience? Who am I addressing today? Who am I meeting with today? How much do I know about that person or those people? What? What is important to them? Not you, them. That particular person or audience, what's, what do they value most? And lastly, how? How do you want them to feel after you're done? When you walk out the door, how would you like them to feel about that interaction? OK, so let's sharpen the pencil a little bit here on those questions and let's let's drill into that a little bit more. So let's say you've got an upcoming meeting that's very important uh, within an individual or a group. You want to ask who? Who is my audience? But let's let's make that a little bit more specific. Do you know any of their names? And, you know, do you have any idea who they are in that room by name before you walk in? Uh, do you know their titles? Maybe you don't know their names, but hey, I'm addressing a group of fill in the blanks. Do I know why they're in this meeting or presentation? Now, that seems like kind of a dumb question at first blush, but let me explain what I mean. Very few people actually consider why this meeting is taking place and what's going on around it. Okay, 
So what I mean by that specifically is if you're going to, let's say you're reporting uh, your budget to the city or to the uh, county government, you, you need to ask yourself, why are those people that I'm reporting to in this meeting? Well, the answer is they have to be. They have to sit in that seat. They didn't say, oh my gosh, the library's coming to report. Let's all go, let's all show up. This is gonna be great. That's not why they're in the meeting. They're in the meeting because by charter, uh, by rules, they've gotta be sitting in those seats at a certain day at a certain time. And you just happen to be on the agenda for that particular meeting. So you need to understand that. They're not there because you're there. They're there because they have to be there. So in every meeting, ask yourself, what's the purpose of this meeting? Why are the people sitting in the seats? All right. Have I met any of them before? Do you know anybody in this particular audience? And then what generations are they? And we'll get to that a little bit later. Second, what? What is important to them? So let's sharpen the pencil on that question a little bit. What does this audience value? It's a great question. What do they value? What do they already need to know that, you know what, I don't need to cover that. I mean, think about how dumb it would have been, you all, if I had started this uh, session by telling you, hey, it's great to be here on this day at this time. And, you know, I'm in the Eastern time zone and you're in the Central time zone, but I'm like, that's just stuff you don't need to cover. I'm just wasting time. What is it that they already know you don't need to cover? What do they need most from me? This is the super important question. Let me drill down into this a little bit more. Let's say it's technical information. Let's, in, in your all's case, let's say that you're reporting out to uh, the city council or to the fiscal court, and they really need to know the, the mechanics of your budget. Well, you need to bring the mechanics of your budget. And uh, if you don't know those mechanics, then bring the person who does know that so that they can be there to answer that, if that's what they need most from you in this particular meeting. Maybe they need timeliness. You all, if you're trying to get into the Lexington city budget, for example, you're trying to get a budget line item and you, you come to me and say, Jay, I want you to help me get this in. Well, even though our budget year starts August 1, you need to have that to me probably by February 1 because the way our system works and processes, I've got to have that to the mayor's budget uh, in February so that that can roll out in April, then we can handle it in May and June. So maybe timeliness is what I need from you. Maybe it's conciseness. Maybe it's just your enthusiasm. You know, I, I know this sounds ridiculous, but I cannot be more excited about your thing than you. I can't be more excited about your library than you are. So if you come in at a six, and expect me to be an eight or a 10 in enthusiasm, you are fooling yourself. No one's gonna be more excited about your thing than you. So maybe I just need to see that you're excited about that. Maybe I need your truthfulness. Uh, maybe that's what I need most. Uh, or that this is the best value. In this situation, what we're talking about, council member or magistrate or mayor or county judge, what we're talking about is the best value for the community. Maybe that's what I need to see from this meeting. But whatever is most important to that audience, you need to bring, all right? I think the biggest thing that you all need to bring them constantly is no conflict. That whatever you're talking about, whatever you're trying to bring to the table offers them no conflict. That's super important to elected officials, let me just tell you. All right, how? How should they feel after I'm done, when I leave this meeting, how do I want them to feel? So let's sharpen that. What's the feeling I want them to leave with? Well, for you guys today watching this, I want you to be encouraged. That is definitely the feeling I want to leave you with, okay? Uh, but maybe you want to leave your audience challenged or scared. You know what? Scared isn't a bad thing in the right context. Uh, let's say that you've got an employee that's just simply not doing very well. They're just not cutting the mustard. They uh, they're really actually pretty bad. Um, having a meeting with them where they walk out scared for their job, that's an appropriate emotion for that. Uh, maybe you want this group to be inspired or thoughtful, cautious, emboldened, curious, humbled, honored, appreciated. Whatever it is, I just want you 
to really consider the feeling you want to leave them with, okay? Literally, gang, if you take a minute, 60 seconds, and do the three questions before your next meeting, whether it's with your staff or your family, or it's as big as with your local elected officials, um, and you just do these questions, boy, you're going to connect so much better. You don't have to worry about perfection. You can really just focus on connection. All right. So we've attacked the first two headwinds, the COVID pandemic, people having short attention spans. Let's get to the third one because this is the biggie. This is a huge, huge headwind. More generations working side by side. Did you know there are now five separate generations potentially working side by side, all communicating different, all wanting it their own way. And you know what? Different generations see things differently. Now, I know that's a very obvious statement, but let me give it to you this way. If I were to ask you to define these two words, simple technology, ask yourself, would someone define those differently that's older than you? Would someone that's younger than you define them differently? Of course they would. And I just said, though, simple technology. Well, this is simple technology. But depending upon what generation you are, you may see that very, very differently than I thought I said it, okay? Uh, contact information. Let's say that um, I'm doing this, this event live and you come up to me afterwards and say, man, Jay, that was great. Boy, I'd love to, uh, to get your contact information. All right, well, what do you mean? Do you want my LinkedIn profile? Do you want that thing off my phone? Or do you want a business card? You know, contact information can be a lot of different things depending upon what generation you are. And every word is like that. I mean, time management, different generations see that differently. Success, very differently. Leadership, absolutely. Mental health, just think how different generations define that. Flexible work environment. What does that even mean anymore, right? Community impact. You know, our library is having a tremendous community impact. Well, depending upon what generation is hearing that, they're going to define that very differently. Good government. What in the world is that? A wide selection here at the library. Well, I was down at a library in, in uh, southern Kentucky a few months ago, and they were talking about this word, or these words wide selection, and one of the guys said that the older uh, constituency that frequents the library would not think that the library had a wide selection because they were removing so many physical periodicals from the shelves. Those older folks uh, above 78 were saying, no, nope, you don't really have that wide of a selection. <laughs> Ease of access. We have a ton, just the, the, our resources here at the library, there's such ease of access. Well, maybe, maybe not, depending upon the generation. Appropriate material. You know, we can just skip right over that, right? I mean, we all know, how that is just lighting fires across the state and around the country, but different generations define that differently. And then if we want to start a generational riot, we can just throw up the words hard work and everybody goes to fight, right? The words hard work kind of just cause all kinds of friction in the workplace. You all, the bottom line to this is these generational differences, they're a really big deal. And they're a big deal for you because decision makers are changing elected officials are changing generationally. This is a really, really big deal and we need to make it super simple because it can be very complex. So I wanna give you a tool that's gonna make it very, very simple for you. And this one is a monster takeaway from today. You, you really need to keep this tool in your hip pocket and use it going forward. It's called generations in a word. Simply put, we're gonna go through each generation starting with traditionals and I'm gonna give you one word to remember for that generation. One word. And you, if you can remember that for that generation, you are golden. You could connect. So let's talk about traditionals. They were born before 1946, which in the year 2023 makes them around 78-ish and a little bit older and older. Um, their word is the word rules. They love and appreciate rules and structure. And why wouldn't they? I mean, think about the public works programs of FDR military bureaucracy of World War II, post-World War II corporate bureaucracy. They, they just want to know what the rules are. That's their word. Now, let me give you a, a couple of images. Every time I give you a, um, a word, I want to make sure I drive it home with some images. 
when you think of traditionals, I want you to picture an Apple Watch versus an hourglass, meaning you have to operate on their time, not your time. They are not but if, they, if you'll slow down for them, well, they want to share so much institutional knowledge, but they want to do it with people who want to listen to them. So you need to slow down when you're with them. Operate on their time. The other reason I show you an hourglass is because they recognize that time is running shorter, that they are in the fourth quarter, and they want to share their, their lives with folks. And what's funny is, is that so many of us that are younger, we're running around so busy. We don't have time for these folks. And what we're doing is we're chasing um, answers to questions like, you know, how do you stay married to the same person for decades? Uh, how do you come back from failure? How do you raise children or grandchildren? How do you deal with success? What's crazy is these folks already know some of those answers. Instead of us running around and missing out on them, maybe what we need to do is slow down. Here's the connection point. Slow down when you're with them. And I want you to ask questions to them, but set it up this way. Ask them, what are the rules that would help me come back from this failure? What are the rules that would help me stay married to the same person for multiple decades? What, what are the rules that would help me, whatever. If you set it up that way, tremendous connection with traditionals. All right, let's move to boomers. Boomers were born roughly between 1946 and 1966. That makes you about 58 to 77-ish right now. Never get hung up in the years, you all, because you'll go online tonight and see that, uh, that, that this stat uh, has those years off by three years or this report has it off by two or whatever. It's more about the word. And the, the word for boomers is legacy, legacy. Baby boomers, you all are retiring at a rate of 10 a day for the next 15 plus years. For the next 15 plus years, 10,000 baby boomers are going to retire. Some volunteer to retire. Some are going to be voluntold to retire. But to have mattered, you want your life to have mattered. Legacy is very important. So when you're working with these folks, you want uh, to constantly try to put their personal name into the cornerstone of the building. Always try and put their name into the cornerstone of the building, meaning you want to tie whatever it is you're talking about to their legacy. Mr. Smith, this just only enhances the legacy you've built in this area or this community. Ms. Jones, you know, by not going this route, I'm afraid that might harm the legacy that you've built, this amazing legacy that you have. Always tie it to legacy. So the way that you connect is you ask questions around legacy. Hey, what do you want to leave as a legacy? Uh, how do you want your kids or your coworkers or this community describing you to others after you're gone? Whether that means you're gone, gone, or just retired. Asking questions about legacy is critical when you're working with baby boomers. Gen X is next. That's my generation, those born between 66 and 81. That makes us about 42 to 57 right now. Our word is level, level. Now I wonder why that would be level. What's interesting is, is it has everything to do with the video games we grew up playing. If you think about it, if you're Gen X, every single video game was constructed basically the same. You put a quarter in a machine, you got three lives, and you rode those lives climbing as many levels as you could as long as you could to ultimately try and get high score. Now, what's interesting is that Gen X, I know this is a deeply psychological moment and deep insight, but here you go. Uh, what's funny is about these games that we grew up playing, the technology of the day only allowed us to put three initials in. We couldn't put our whole names in. And so what's funny is, is that Gen X tends to play against games versus people. We compete against games, not people. This is very hard for boomers to understand because boomers can draw a circle around a person and say, I'm gonna beat. Gen X doesn't really think that way. We are trying to climb levels in a game. You all, I won six elections. I never once was running against a person. I was trying to level up in that game, get elected to that. 
so let me switch the word games to the word priorities. And what you want to do is you want to ask Gen X when you're connecting to them or are trying to move them to action is, hey, Jay, what are your top two priorities? Now, the reason why you want to ask what are your top two is because it's hard for me to peg what my top priority is today. But if you were asking me that right now, I would say my family. Uh, we have two children that are uh, just finished their freshman year in college. I would love to spend as much time with my wife and my kids as I can. My second priority probably is this business. Gosh, I love doing what I'm doing. I love teaching this and encouraging people and helping folks understand how to communicate and lead better. So what your job is, if you're trying to move me to action, you've got to recognize those two priorities are the video games that I'm trying to level up in. You need to position what you're selling me, what you're trying to get me to do to help me climb levels in one or both of those games, okay? Next, millennials. Millennials, you all have become the largest generation in the workplace and the largest generation on the planet. Born between 81 and 2000, making you about 23 to 41-ish right now. Uh, your word is impact. You want to have impact and you want it now. Uh, you all have a DNA where you want to change the world and you want to change it now. And let's figure out why that is. Here's what's interesting. Let's just take video games for a second and compare. The video instructed video games. Stores have everything to do with story. They don't really have anything to do with points. Even the games you think would have something to do with points, like football games or basketball games. See, I can make Aaron Rodgers play for the Kansas City Chiefs if I wanted to, because I control the story. Everything millennials you have grown up with or have at your disposal allows you to control the story, to be the star, the producer, the director, uh, for, to be the filmmaker, the editor. And so you want to have that impact and you want it now. So one of the things, uh, one of the most powerful ways to connect to millennials, whether you are one and you're talking to another millennial or you're outside the generation, is to ask the question, how do you see changing the world and how can I help? Always giving permission to the other person on the receiving, uh, you give them permission not to know the answer right now. But what I've found is, is if you will ask millennials this question, See change in the world and how can I help? It is an amazing connection tool. It goes straight to what's important to them. Okay. Powerful tool. Uh, connection. Uh, question. All right. Gen Z, born roughly between 2000 and 2015, makes them about seven to 22 ish. Let me just say, as of today in 2023, the bottom end of millennials and the top end of Gen Z is a real squishy line. They kind of look alike, but they're very different. That's why the word is very important. Whichever word they, they identify with is really um, kind of who they are. Um, one of the things you need to understand about them also is they're in school right now. Uh, they're in elementary school, middle school, high school, in college. Some would say just out of college, but the bottom line is they are your incoming uh, workers and incoming uh, new presence into the workforce. Their word is customized. Everything in their world is customized to them. The example I give you is Riley's letter jacket. This is my daughter when she was a freshman in high school. She lettered in volleyball. She went to the same high school I did, Lafayette High School in Lexington. And in Lexington, there's one place you buy your letter jackets from. Uh, and I bought mine in 1984 from there. Mom and dad bought, bought mine. And what's funny is, is that in 1984, if you were an athlete, you got a red letter jacket with a blue L. And that was your options. In 2018, when Riley lettered, uh, what you're looking at on the screen has probably 2,000 decisions in it. That bottom little piece down there around her waist, yeah, that had like 40 different design options just to that. I didn't count the cuffs or the collar. They could have been different. The length could have been different. You could have had a hood. You could have had leather sleeves, cloth sleeves, colored sleeves. I mean, you all, there's so many decisions in this, but nobody on the planet has a leather jacket like my daughter. Everything in their world, Gen Z's world, is customizable to them, all right? So 
whenever you're working with Gen Z, one of the great connection questions is, um, may I share something with you that might shorten the runway to your success? The magic phrase is shorten the runway to success, okay? Always ask them for that permission and they will grant it almost every single time. There's, there's very few I've ever seen not say yes to that question. So you've got this tool in your hip pocket now. You've got generations in a word. Traditionals, the word is rules. First, it's legacy. Gen X, it's level. Millennials impact. And Gen Z, it's customized. You all, in an eight second world, this is a monster tool in your hip pocket, especially when it comes to your elected officials, because now we need to overlay that onto your elected officials. Well, I want you to. Who's your mayor, or if you have a vice mayor, or a city council, your city council members, or if you have a city manager uh, in the city government, or your county judge and your magistrates in the county, um, in your county government, what age are they? Because whatever the word is for that age is one of the things that matters to them. So remember the who, what, how. Well, who they are, what's important to them. If you know their generation and you know that generation's word, that's important to them, okay? So here's what I want to do. Literally, gang, I'm going to be quiet for a minute and a half. I'm just going to stop talking for a minute and a half. Will you pull out that sheet of paper? And all I want you to do is just to consider who your mayor, who your county judge is, your council members, your magistrates, whatever, whoever you're interfacing with or it's important to interface with, just jot them down and try to peg what generation they are and then put that word out to the side. All right, I'm going to be quiet for about 90 seconds. Go. Okay, again, not exhaustive, but this is just something to start you considering who is it that you are interfacing with, what generation are they? Uh, I was in a, a community back last March uh, speaking for that group, and it was the city government, the outgoing mayor who had just, he was retiring, was a baby boomer, incoming mayor was a millennial. And, and it's just fascinating to see that dynamic starting to happen where legacy was super important to this particular gentleman and the new mayor was wanting to come in and have immediate impact in that community and start to do certain things that would, would start to create that impact that they saw in their head. This you can take to the bank. These words are absolutely true for these generations. Okay, so now again, connection versus perfection. North Star. The goal is to get you connected in those elected offices better, putting you in a position so you now are seen as a community asset, you personally, as well as your library and the library system. So let's shift gears dramatically now. Everything we've been talking about is the, are the really is the context of our world today. It's the world that we live in. Let's shift now and look at your library as that community asset, 
How do we position it in such a way that they see it the way it should be seen? Okay. And how can we really make it simple? Let's start at 30,000 feet. Uh, let's start big and then we'll go down a little bit from there. What we're going to do is I just want you to understand how do local elected officials think. Okay. And the first thing that you have to understand to answer that question is which office are they holding? Because depending upon the office, office they hold, whether executive or legislative, they think different, all right? So let's make that super simple. Let's start with the executive branch. So we're talking about your mayors and your county judges. The executive uh, branch of your local government is your mayor or your county judge. And the first thing you have to understand about that person is they are responsible for everything. Everything in the county or everything in the city rolls up to them as an individual. They are the one throat to choke. If it goes wrong, everybody goes after the mayor or the county judge. If something goes right, they're certainly going to take credit for it, okay? Because they are responsible for everything. When I say everything, let me explain what I mean. They have to come up with a budget called a proposed budget, and then whatever the budget ends up being, because the legislature gets a hold of it and actually creates it, they have to execute as the executive branch, they got to execute whatever that budget ends up being, you all. So whatever the number is and whatever those money dollars are supposed to be spent on, they have to make that work. They have to execute the daily operation of government, which means all of public safety from police, fire, uh, corrections. Uh, they have to be responsible for every bit of infrastructure, your roads, your sewer, your water. Uh, they're responsible for parks and rec and on and on and on. They also represent everyone in that community. Every single person in that community, whether they love them or hate them, they represent them, okay? They're elected every four years and they have to balance the needs and the wants of every individual and every group inside that community. So literally every day they're trying to juggle what everybody out there wants from them. So that makes it really hard for them to focus on any one thing for any length of time. It's very, they're very, very schizophrenic because everything's kind of pulling and tugging at them moment to moment. Okay. Depending upon the community you live in, they probably have another job as well. They do something other than being the mayor or the county judge. Depends on the community. Um, the bottom line to it is, is that they are, um, they may have a job outside of. Okay, so let's now shift to the legislative branch. So when you're working with city council members or fiscal court magistrates, those folks, they have a constitutional a chartered responsibility for passing resolutions and ordinances and bu budgets. Simply put, their job is to make laws and to pass budgets. That is all we in the legislative branch are elected to do. That is the only responsibility by law that we have is to create laws and to uh, create budgets. That is our job. Now we end up being glorified customer service reps because everybody knows us and we have influence and can make things happen. But at the end of the day, the executive branch runs the city or the county. We in the legislative branch create the laws that people have to abide by, and the budgets that we operate under. So as, it as let's talk budgets for a second. We have to take the executive branch proposes as a budget, and we have to work that thing and make it work, and we actually pass the official budget for the city or the county. We are not responsible for the day. I do not have to worry about the sewer backing up. I don't have to worry about the police uh, pay issue as far as a moment-to-moment -moment situation, or um, if uh, this particular park needs mowing today. That is not my job. I am not responsible for that. Now, certainly, I care about that, and uh, you know, and I certainly have a voice in that. But I'm not ultimately responsible. As a legislative branch member, we're usually focused on a few specific areas that have my heart. So for me. I was all about health and wellness. I was the guy building trails in our parks and all across our city. 
uh, I was working a lot with uh, about uh, food deserts and good healthy foods. I was working with the school systems a lot. I cared a lot about health and wellness and physical activity. And I cared a lot about economic development. But past that, I wasn't necessarily every minute thinking about something else. Other council members, that was their focus. So what you have to realize is when you're dealing with a legislative branch member, we generally have a few things that really matter to us and we deal with everything else. All right, we, instead of representing everyone, we generally represent a defined portion of the city or the county. So myself as a, a city council member in Lexington, I represented one twelfth of the city and I had about 30,000 people at, at that time that were constituents of mine. They were the only people that could vote me in or vote me out. While I represented the entire city and, and everything I did impacted the entire city, the only people that were my constituents, meaning the people that could vote me in or out, were those 30,000 in this little pie of Lexington, okay? And that's very important for you to understand. So what's tough about us is we represent generally our family, our friends, and our neighbors, and everybody knows where we live. So we're always getting an earful at the grocery store about why haven't, hasn't this gotten done? And th did you see the condition of the ball fields the other day? And so forth and so on. We may have a shorter term than the mayor or the county judge, depending upon where you live and how you're set up. I had two year terms. So I was running every two years, the mayor, the county judge, every four years. And in most situations, every situation, unless you were retired, you likely had another job that you were doing. So you were a realtor, you ran the family business, uh, you, uh, you know, you did these other jobs or this other work, and then you came to the to city hall or to the, uh, the administration building and you uh, put on your elected hat and did your governmental job. Okay, whether you're in the elect <laughs> executive branch or legislative branch, both of them share a couple of things. One, elections are popularity contests. You all, I hate to burst your bubble on this one, but that's all it is. Elections are popularity contests. Who can get their name out the best, the most effective, their message, the most concise? Look, to be elected to any office does not require a resume. No prior experience is required. It's the only job you can get out there where you don't have to demonstrate any prior uh, experience or really any competency in it. It is a popularity contest. I've got to go out sell myself that I'm the person you should vote for for this particular office. And if enough people uh, believe that and pull that lever, then it is a temp job. It is a temp job, either two years or four years, meaning I have to reapply for that job every two or four years, depending upon the election cycle that I'm in. People can vote me in or out, but the bottom line to it is I only have two or four years at a time to get things, I have no guarantee I'm gonna sit in this office past that, that term. Now, there are two separate skills to be successful in politics, and they are very different from one another. The first is you've gotta be able to campaign well. You gotta get the job. You gotta be able to articulate who you are and why you're different, what you stand for. You've gotta to connect to a lot of people, a lot of various people to get the job. And then if you get the job, you got to govern and you got to do the job. Those are very different skills. And what's crazy is I guarantee you, you know somebody that can campaign really well. They, they can get elected and they're just not really good at governing. Uh, they're, they're just sort of weak uh, or maybe even incompetent in some cases. There's also tons of people out there that would be great in office office, they just can't get elected. They just cannot campaign well. Two separate skills to be successful in politics. You got to get the job and then you got to do the job. Here's what's really interesting is we're usually making 50% of the population mad 100% of the time. Every decision I made, generally half of the population was like, that's terrible. And the other half is like, that's great. The moment I changed, or, or the moment we moved to something else, I made another 50%, a different 50% mad 
over that. And you're always making folks mad. So it's very important to understand this next line. The general population has no comprehension how government actually works. So they're always frustrated with government. We're always either apathetic or really. And if you remember back when I said earlier, it's very important for you to be able to bring me no conflict. This is where that lies. I am generally getting blown up by somebody at all times over something. When someone comes to me that it doesn't have any conflict to it, it actually is super helpful. Gosh, I want to be around folks like that. Here's the best part about this bottom line where the general population doesn't know how government works. I don't expect you to know how government works and to be an expert on parliamentary procedure and how we do things here in the city or the county. All you've got to do is know me. If I'm elected, if I'm at the table, you just have to have a relationship with me. It's my job to know how government works. Your job is to know someone in government, okay, going forward. All right. I, I hate to burst your bubble. I know, I know this is going to shock you, but they don't wake up thinking about you every day. Um, really, I don't wake up thinking about the library or the library director unless the house is on fire, unless something has gone bad wrong, unless all my constituents are blowing me up over something that the library is involved in or done or not done or what, then it's like the all-seeing eye of Sauron. It's like all of a sudden now every eye is on you. And I know that's what's happened in a lot of our communities, um, you know, with all that's, that we're talking about appropriate material and things like that. But that's why the seeing eye of, Sar of Sauron is on you is because the house is on fire. But generally speaking, they're not waking up thinking about you. So here's the deal. My question is, how can you build bridges before the house gets on fire, before there's a problem? How can you do some things today going forward from this uh, time that we've had together and, and actually create that, uh, that bridge where you are seen as that community asset, all right? Well, the answer is simply to, let's just go back, all right? I think this is where the secret lies. I'll focus these three questions on your elected who they are specifically, what's important to them, and how you want them to feel after they interact. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to give you a couple of questions on the screen and I'm gonna be quiet for just, I don't know, 30 seconds after I leave them up on the screen. Will you take your pen and paper and just jot down some quick answers to this? This is not exhaustive. It's only time to get you thinking in this direction. Okay? So who are your specifically? All right, I want you to think about uh, whoever it is, court or city hall, I'm going to give you a few seconds on the clock. And this is, these are the questions I want you to consider. Do you know any of their names? What are the names and the titles? Do you, have you met them before? Do you know any of them personally? And if so, which ones do you have maybe a personal relationship with? Uh, which ones represent you and your family? That is a really critical thing. You have the right to talk to me if you live in my district. You have a right to ask for a meeting with me anytime because I am your representative. So who represents you and your family? Uh, because that can give you a tremendous opportunity to connect. Uh, how long have they served? When is re-election coming? Are they running? Meaning, do they only have another year before they're gone? Um, are they going to run again? Uh, are they thinking about that? Is that something? Just no, having a general idea about that. And then what generations are they? All right, I'm going to be quiet for about one minute and just start to address those questions. Go.
move on to what uh, again focus your attention on your elected officials in your community picture them in your head and i want to just have you thinking about questions like what are the biggest issues facing them facing your community obviously there are certain things in your community that maybe is are unique to you all what are their priorities individually meaning that county judge, that mayor, those council members, that and those fiscal court magistrates, what do you know are their priorities individually? And if you don't know the answer to these, that's totally fine too, but these are the type of questions you need to be thinking about. What do they need most from me as a leader of the library? Um, critical, critical question. Look inwardly, look in the mirror. What is it that they need you as um, that director, that, that leader in the community, representing the library. And then what do they need most from the library itself, the, the, the organization, the institution? I mean, I would say they need you to be a problem solver. So how, how are you a problem solver? Uh, children programming partner. Obviously that's something you can do very well um, that might be very important and maybe what they need most. Maybe it's a park and rec partner uh, that, that you can, You've got certain programs that are just excellent for parks and rec. Maybe it's a, conven a community convener. You're someone that can bring the community together physically. And then that physical space provider. You, you are definitely a place, a physical space where people can meet or have as a resource. So I'm going to be quiet again for about a minute, minute and a half. Just jot down any answers you have to these questions. Go. All right, as we keep going here, just how would you like them to feel when they think of the library? What is it that you would like me as a city council member, uh, as an elected person in your community, how do you want me to feel about you? What are those feelings you want? And, you know, specifically, uh, again, picture the picture in your minds, you know, do you want them to see you as the library really understanding them and their challenges? Do you want uh, the library to, to be seen as that partner that can solve problems? Um, maybe it's the library can help you, them more than any other entity in the community because fill in the blank. I'm just going to give you one on the clock. Just answer how you want them to feel. Okay, as we land the plane for today, as we're coming in for a landing, uh, the, big, the big thing is, I, I know we can't boil the ocean today. I know that there's a whole lot we've talked about, but it really does roll up to connection versus perfection. Con 
connecting to that audience, not worrying about you being perfect or having everything uh, completely perfect and hoping they get all that. Rather, just building those relationships properly and building those bridges. To do that, you have to understand what is challenging them. Same thing that's challenging you, but you've got to think about it through their lens as the leaders of that community uh, governmentally, they are navigating COVID and now post-COVID. They are navigating people not having any attention spans and not listening. And they're dealing with multiple generations in that community they have to represent across the board. And all of those are challenging them. We all know the phrase that the journey of a thousand steps begins with that single uh, journey of a thousand miles begins with that single step. So let me just give you a step. Actually, it's three steps, but a step that you can do today coming with this that's very practical and tactical. And if this was all you ever got from me, that this would be enough. This would start to change the game for you in your community. Here are the three things I want you to do. First, I want you to write down who you already have a positive relationship with in government and who represents you where you live. Now, they may be the same people, but who do you already have a positive relationship with? Gosh, you know, I've known the mayor since we both were in high school or gosh, this uh, this magistrate and I, you know, we live next door to each other and our kids play ball. Who do you already know that you have a solid positive relationship with? And a second question is who represents you where you live? In Lexington, if you lived in Lexington, Kentucky district, I would represent you as a district council member. The three at-large council members would represent you along with the mayor. That is five separate elected officials that you have representation with and you can go have a meeting with anytime you want because we represent you. You are a constituent. All right, so the first thing you're gonna do after we're done, is I want you to write down uh, a list of those people that fall into those two categories. Once you've done that, then I want you to take those three questions, the who, what, how, and apply it to those people. Uh, run the who, what, how on those and really laser in on just them. And then the third, and this is the big one, you all, the third piece is to ask for a relaxed meeting to understand them better. What I mean specifically is the house isn't on fire. This is a, hey, Jay, uh, like, can we grab coffee? I'd love to hear what your priorities are in your elected office. You know, you and I may know each other. Uh, we may have gone to school together and you've known me my whole life. But when I step into those governmental chambers, I become an alien because I talk a different language than you, very different. Uh, I mean, think about this, you all. Here's a statement nobody ever thinks they would ever utter. We have to take a vote to see if we can take a vote. That is an actual thing. We have to take a vote to see if we can take a vote. That's just not, that's alien. So my point is, even if you know me outside of uh, my governmental role. When I get in there, I talk differently. I think differently. So ask for a relaxed meeting with me to understand what my priorities are. What am I not trying to accomplish? Uh, what are the things that matter to me as a, as a council member that you can help me with? As for that relaxed meeting in the next seven days, from today, from the time you watch this, number one, who do you have that positive relationship with or who represents you? Number two, run the three questions, who, what, how, on that person or those people so that you've really got an understanding, and then ask for a relaxed meeting. That relaxed meeting may come a month from now, but just ask for the meeting in the next seven days and just sit and listen and start build the bridges now. If you do that, they are going, and that's what I want for you today is to be seen as that community asset, to be seen as that leader in your community that really is a problem solver, that's my partner, that's not adversarial, that's someone I can really rely upon. To do that, if you'll do the, those three steps, you can make that, that happen. And you can make it happen so positively and so quickly, uh, it's amazing. So 
I want you to be able to be seen differently and walk away from today being encouraged and equipped that you can now do those types of things immediately. So here's the deal. I am finished and I am so grateful for your time today. As was mentioned earlier, later this fall, August, September, uh, we're going to do a tour across the state so that we're going to be within your region. It's going to be a, a two hour night where we really just, or, or day, where we spend some time digging into your community, problem solving and workshopping uh, for you, running some of these things at a deeper level. And then what we're going to do from there is, uh, as, as Shannon mentioned, you're going to have the ability this summer uh, going forward from today that if you've got something specific and want to just run it by i'm available gene is going to be able to coordinate that but the bottom line to it is that i want to walk with you all as pro library professionals so that you don't have to uh, be under the pressure you're under to not understand some of this stuff or, or feel like it's a foreign language i want you to know you've got someone in your corner now that can actually help so with that i'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to uh, come back over here. And it is back to you. If hey, Jay, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Can okay. you hear, hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, we don't okay. have any um, questions in the chat, but we still have a minute that if you want to add something. But I'd, I thought of a question. Um, I thought of actually two questions is, you know, every August I uh, appear before the fiscal court to um, uh, have our taxes, right, okay. accepted by fiscal court. And, you know, I'm always told you take advantage of that time and you brag on the library. And I've done that for the last two years. But I also always get that impression that they really just want me to come in and do my business and leave. And I'm wondering, you know, based on some of your comments, if I need to stick it, stick to that, you know, go before them, read my tax rates, let them, you know, say yay and be out the door. Um, yeah, so if I'm coaching you on that, how long do you have in front of them is my first question. Well, I mean, again, I mean, I guess it would be um, if they told me just to be quiet and like move on, you know, I've usually okay. not taken anything more than five minutes. Um, okay. If that, you know, I just, yeah. you know, try to highlight, I say the tax rates, they vote it, but then I say, hey, I want to, you know, tell you about this, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, but I do get that look of like, we want just to get through our agenda. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love it when we've been sitting there for eight hours for something and then someone goes on and on and on and on. And, and it's like, oh, my gosh, if you would just like knock that out, I would love you so much more. I'll vote for that. Just, just get me out of here. So my, my the, the easy answer to that is I would have you go ahead and put your wins on a sheet for me. Here's all the things, the brag sheet. Mm -hmm. Here's all the things we've done in summary. Uh, so if I want to ask a question about that, I can. You pass that out in advance. Uh, you get you take the mic, say council members uh, or fiscal court. I, I know your time is very valuable, and I know you're sitting in those seats for a long time. Um, what I'm going to do is I just want to share with you my tax rate. If there's any questions you have on that, I'm certainly here to answer that. Um, and uh, and I have one. You've got a brag sheet or a sheet that is our wins. I would point out that top one on there is a big win. We were able to do blah, 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 blah. And then here's our tax rate. I'm here for any questions. I would love you for that. Like okay. I can look at that. And I want to ask questions, you know, and now, now we're talking political strategy here for just a second. But let's say that I am your, your Confederate sitting on city council or sitting in the seat. I love you. I, I'm big on the, on that. You tell me in advance, hey, Jay, ask me a question about number three on my sheet that I'm going to give you, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we play that game of, Shannon, I noticed here that you run mm -hmm. this children's program and you think successfully. What, what happened there? You can game that out, gang. It's okay. If you've got somebody on there that is your confederate, that they love you and they want to make sure that 
you're seen in a positive light, that's okay. But to your point, Shannon, I would just have a brag sheet. I would talk about whatever the top one is, give them, uh, show that what matters to them is getting in and getting out. I want to make sure that we do this quickly. Here's my tax rate. If you've got questions, I'm here. Any questions? No? Thank you so much. Okay. That would, that would be huge. And, and you're giving me an opportunity to dig into that if I want to talk about the tax rate or I want to talk about anything on the brag sheet. Um, that, but if not, that, that's not a slight against you or the library is what I want you to hear. Is right. It's just uh, my head's so full. Or, and, and you don't know, maybe we've got a really tough agenda item coming up three, three down from you that mm -hmm. are, it's like, oh, nobody wants to talk about this, but we've got this huge problem and it's coming, you know? So just be aware that their disinterest or wanting to move on is not a reflection of, of anything other than maybe where their head is in that moment. Does right. that make sense? Yes, it does. It does. Um, and the other question I have, um, um, you know, because there might be someone here on the call now, but what's that first step, you know, that we should take if we have that fractured relationship with our, with our county judge exec executive? Yeah, I, I think, and that's tough. If, if you're already sideways there, um, you know, it's like with any kind of other relationship, it's, you know, there has to be trust rebuilt. I think what I would look for is some easy, low fruit, something that helps that particular person, either individually or in their, in their role. Is there anything you can do in the next little bit uh, to help that person specifically where it's a, hey, judge, I know, uh, you know, we're probably on the wrong foot here. I know last uh, two weeks ago kind of got contentious. Uh, I just want you to know that I really respect you for the position. I, I know that this is really tough. I was thinking about you and I wanted to bring you this. Uh, I thought maybe this might help you with some of the other stuff you were doing. I wanted to give you this. Uh, I think trying to find olive branches that are all about that other person and not about you, acknowledging the strained relationship, but trying to do everything you can to try and build some of that bridge back. You're probably not gonna build the whole bridge in that meeting, but mm -hmm. give me a little uh, that, that just shows, okay, well maybe Shannon's not as bad as I thought she was, or maybe we just got a little heated the other night. And But okay. but I think that's what I would tell you to do. Okay, all Does right. That help? Yeah, no, I think that's great. Okay. All right, last call for questions. Any questions? Good well, news is I'm around all year. <laughs> that's right. Around all year. Well, thank you so much for your time. I so appreciate it. Um, just a reminder, um, notes will be sent out. I captured the recording, so we'll send that out um, and upload it to the um, KPLA YouTube channel that we're creating. We'll send more of that information out. And if you do need to talk to Jay, please reach out to Jean Rourke. She is um, organizing everything, scheduling those meetings, all of that kind of good stuff. So hope to see you in the fall at one of the locations that I added as well. Thank, Thank you. you Everybody for your time. Thank you.